Hello everyone, I'm Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, here for another episode of Goulet Q&A. This is number 45. Wow, 45, that's crazy. Um, it's August 22nd of 2014, I think, yeah, wow. It's hard to believe how fast this year's going by. This is completely insane. Uh, it has really been a crazy year for us here at Goulet. A lot of, a lot of hiring going on, a lot of growth, that's really cool. Um, I always like to say that we're plagued with good problems around here uh, related to growth and expansion and so on. Uh, I'm really being stretched as a manager, as a leader. Um, you know, I've been trying to still continue to do videos and stuff. Did a couple in the last week. I did one on the, uh, I did the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. I got challenged by my sister-in-law, Rebecca. Um, so that was kind of fun. And I challenged, you know, Brad Dowdy, Stephen Brown, and Brian Gray of Edison Pens. And uh, they all stepped up, either donated or did the ice bucket or both. Um, I ended up doing both. I donated, but I still just thought it would be really cool to do the ice bucket thing. So I did that. Got some cool pictures. So check the blog out for that. Um, and then did uh, launch the Goulet Grip this week. So the Goulet Grip is pretty cool. It's just a, you know, black uh, piece of hard kind of sticky rubber that you can use to pull the nibs out of some of your more stubborn pens. So it's just a handy tool that I've been using around here for a while, actually, probably a couple of years. Drew and I especially have been pulling a lot of nibs out of pens with it. And I eventually just kind of thought like, gee, this would probably be a pretty handy tool for other people to have, wouldn't they? So launched that this week. So that was really cool. Um, so I've got kind of an interesting situation this week. Um, Rachel and I are actually going to be out of town for most of next week, and so I would normally be missing when I would shoot my Q&A. Uh, so I'm actually going to double them up here. I'm going to shoot one, and then I'm going to back-to-back -to -back shoot another one that I'll plan to post for the following week. So just give you a little heads up, that's what's going to be going on there. Um, but for this week, i got a good number of questions, so I guess I can go ahead and kick that off. Uh, the first one I have is from Luke B. on Facebook. It says, Dear Mr. Goulet, Oh, you're so formal. Uh, my name is Luke, and I've been engaged to my fiance Penny for nearly four years now. Ooh, boy, that is a long engagement. <laughs> Rachel and I were like two years and seven months, and that was plenty long. We were together for almost five years before we got married. Anyway, she's been going through some very hard times lately and is feeling really low about graduating college and not yet getting the job she has always wanted, art historian. She's an avid collector of fountain pens and a religious watcher of your Q&A, and I was wondering if you would give her a shout out in your show. Well, I put this one first because I thought, you know, it just tugged at my heartstrings a little bit here. Rachel and I had a really long engagement and we've been married now. We actually just hit our eighth anniversary. So we've been, we've been together for about 13 years now, which is just crazy. Especially because we're like completely different people now in a way than we were when we met. Uh, you know, the core stuff has stayed the same, but just our interests and stuff have completely changed. So, um, and also it's not uncommon, I don't think, for people graduating now to not be getting jobs immediately in their field. So um, I guess if I had to give any encouraging message to you, Penny, it would probably be that, you know, Luke here obviously cares a lot about you and you two are getting married and you're going to be together for better, for worse, uh, you know, <laughs> richer for poorer. And, you know, Rachel and I have been through some, some of those times in our eight, eight years of marriage. And I can say that careers and stuff are going to change, your interests are going to change, but as long as you two are staying together and staying aligned, you're going to have a really great partner in everything that you're doing. So he obviously cares about you a lot, and that is what matters more than anything else. So the two of you, you're going to be all right. You know, you're going to get through this. It may take you a little while to find exactly what you're looking for. You know, right now I'm doing what I love, but it was a crazy journey for me to get here. You know, I graduated college and didn't use my degree. I was power washing houses with my dad for a while and sealing decks. And I thought I was going to be a painter. I thought I might be a state trooper. I looked into being an electrician and a carpenter. And then I tried being a pen maker before I ultimately got into, you know, video blogging and online retailing of fountain pens, you know, so it's been a pretty uh, wacky journey for me. And, you know, it may be that way for you too, but as long as you got a partner who's aligned with you and is along for the ride, you're going to be just fine. So let me encourage you a little bit there, Penny. You're going to be great. All right. Uh, Peter C. on Facebook. What are the functions of the comb-shaped thing behind the feed? Are they supposed to have ink drops in between those fins? Oh, you actually used the right term there, Peter. Those actually are called the fins on the feed. Um, so what uh, that is, sorry, saying that is what's happened with my newly acquired Pelican M215. I've never seen anything like that with other pens that I have. Ink drops have been seen from the side, but otherwise the pen works normally and writes like a dream. 
Is my pen leaking or is that actually normal behavior? Thanks. All right, Peter, well, what you're talking about there is the fins on the feed. I don't have a Pelican uh, M215 on me right now, but um, you know, if you look on the feed here, you can see these little cuts you know, that are kind of in the feed. And, and when you're, when you're rank, writing with the pen, you might see some ink that kind of builds up in there. The pen's not leaking or anything. Those fins are actually there for a reason. They're there as kind of a little reservoir um, for ink to, to just kind of sit in there. And it acts as a regulator. Um, reason being, you've got a very thin slit that's cut in the feed that um, draws the ink down through capillary action, because ink is mostly water. So it draws it down with capillary action, but if you did not have any type of fin system on your nib or on your feed, you would be completely reliant on the flow through that tiny little slit from the ink reservoir all the way down to the tip of the nib. So if you started writing really fast, it may be faster than the capillary action can draw the ink down through the feed and it would dry up on you. So they put these fins in here to hold extra ink in there so that in times when you're writing really fast, really heavy, whatever the case may be, the paper is really absorbent and is drawing it through faster, it just allows you to have extra ink in there so that your pen is not drying out while you're writing. That's what it's doing. So your pen is fine. As long as it's literally not like dripping out of the pen, you're okay. It's acting completely normal. Um, and different pens will have different feed setups too. That's what can be a little confusing depending on how they are. You know, if you look at like Lamy for an example, Lamy, you know, on the outside doesn't have any fins, but it does on the inside. Um, I don't have a Lamy. I thought I had a Vista around here somewhere, but if you look inside of the grip of the pen, you can see it on the All Stars, the Vista, it's got fins all up in the middle there. So usually pens, if they don't have it here, they'll have it on the inside the grip of the pen. So there's gonna be a fin system somewhere in just about every pen that you're using. It's just not, maybe you can't see it on your other pens. All right, um, Kathy B on Facebook, how should I store my bottles of ink? Right now they're in individual Ziploc bags stored in the kitchen, cupboard, too obsessive. The bottles or colors are often so beautiful, I'd love to store them on a window ledge and let the light shine through. All right, um, well, you're kind of like swinging on opposite ends of the pendulum there. <laughs> Storing them in the Ziploc bags, I mean, it's, that might be a little overkill. You know, usually if you're sealing up, as long as you're, you're sealing the cap on there properly, that's probably going to be good enough as far as sealing it. Basically, you want to make sure that you don't have air exposure and that you don't have sunlight exposure, too. Those are the two things that will degrade your ink the most. The air, because you, your water is going to evaporate, okay? Um, and you can see this, especially if you have, even if you have, like, ink cartridges, um, the, the moisture will actually seep through the plastic over time, and you'll end up with a very diluted, sorry, not diluted, very concentrated version of the dye that's used in the ink, because all the water you let will evaporate out. Now, if that actually does happen, if you say you, you don't have your cap screwed on tightly enough and most of your water evaporates out of there, it might get a little crusty around the cap and you may end up with a very, very dye concentrated version of your ink, but you can always reconstitute it by adding some distilled water into it. So that's not as much a concern. Still, you don't really want a lot of oxygen and air exposure to the ink over a long period of time. So it's good to keep it sealed up, um, but the sunlight is going to be what's going to probably going to cause more damage than anything because the dyes that are used in fountain pen ink are typically not very light fast. In fact, some of them are very, very not light fast at all, um, particularly ones in like the mid blue range. A lot of reds are really weak as well. So if you're putting them, especially in direct sunlight in the bottle, it's going to look really pretty, but it's going to lighten up the color quite a bit because the UV rays from the sunlight are going to degrade the dye content in your ink. So as cool as it probably looks, it's not the best way to store your ink on your windowsill. I'm sorry. And I know that a lot of the bottles are really beautiful and you want to have them sitting out to look at them, but it's kind of a catch 22 of like, you want to look at it, but if you do that, it's going to degrade the ink. So, you know, maybe what you could do is just you know, take a few drops of the ink and put it in water and then put that in an empty bottle that you have so that you can just kind of see it. I don't know. It's just an idea, but, you know, it kind of stinks that it is that way, but, you know, you can't change physics, so. All right, Valerie L. on Facebook. Will Rachel Goulet ever make a video instead of Brian? Will Goulet make an extra, extra fine version of their number six nib? Kind of a two-for-one question there, Valerie. All right, so let's cover the first one. Will Rachel ever make a video instead of me? Um, Rachel's really tied up right now with daily operations and she does a lot more of the behind the scenes stuff. Uh, so um, as much as I like to talk about what Goulet Pens does and, and as much as I get to play with pens and shoot videos and, you know, 
talk in the comments and, and stuff like that. Um, Rachel is the one who's doing our HR, paying our bills, doing our accounting, maintaining our website, you know, so uh, as much as I get the credit for what goes on around here, Rachel is actually uh, probably an even more important part of what goes on here than me. Um, you know, she's the one that makes sure that all of our staff gets their paychecks and makes sure that all of our paperwork is filed on time to make sure that we can stay as a legal operating entity and all those kinds of things. So it's pretty important what she does. So she really doesn't have a lot of extra time to shoot videos and stuff like that. She'll join me every now and then though. She's done some Q and A's and way back in the day, we used to do a live show called Right Time and did a lot of that stuff together. But um, I don't think she likes to be in front of the camera quite as much as I do. Um, she uh, just isn't, you know, isn't geared towards that as much as me. I'm, I'm at this point, I'm very comfortable in front of the camera. So it's really not, really not a struggle for me, but um, for her, it's both time wise and she just doesn't, she doesn't really like being in front of the camera as much as I do. So it's definitely not something that is, is really practical for her to do. Um, however, there is one, I think one video that we've ever done where it was just her. Uh, and if you know what that is, then you are definitely like a Goulet loyalist fan. And I'm not going to tell you which video it is, but those of you who are really hardcore are going to know what's, that's kind of the trivia question of the day, I guess, is what is the one video that Rachel has done solo? Um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, and then the second question you had, Valerie, was will we ever make an extra, extra fine version of our number six nib? Uh, not in the foreseeable future because it's not something that Yovo offers. We get our nibs from Yovo in Germany. You know, I don't, I'm not a nib maker. I get them made by a really good company that makes nibs, Yovo. Um, they don't offer an extra, extra fine from their factory. So it's not anything that we can do practically. And if we did do it, we'd have to get it custom ground by a nibmeister who does that. And it would be very expensive, really not worth it for you. Um, you know, our nibs right now are, are $15 and you would end up paying probably $50 or more to get an extra, extra fine nib. And so it's just probably not really worth it. All right, at D Pawson on Twitter said, what have you learned about fountain pens writing very upright versus nearly laid flat? Well, that's a good question um, because it really can kind of change the way that it feels. Um, you know, personally, I hold my pens fairly low. Um, the ideal writing position is right at about 45 degree angle, right? That's how most nibs are ground to be written with, and that will be kind of the sweet spot for you. If you hold your pens really upright, that's usually what happens with people who are new into the fountain pen hobby, because if you're writing with ball points and roller balls, usually you have to hold them pretty upright in order to get them to flow properly, um, especially ball points where you have to kind of like bear down in order to get them working. Fountain pens, though, they don't operate quite as well sitting upright like this. So they, most of them will work okay. And depending on the pen, some may be ground with a more generous range than others. But I believe that most fountain pens are ground to be done kind of at that 45 degree angle. But depending on how liberal whoever is smoothing the nib at their fa whatever given factory, um, that will determine how smoothly it'll write and what kind of range. But if you have it more upright, generally the pen's going to write drier. It's not going to be as much ink. It's not going. It's going to be a little bit finer line than if you have it more in the proper position, um, and it more than likely is going to feel scratchier, um, as you said. Versus laying more flat. Well, the lower you have it, generally the fatter and wetter your line is going to be, and you can only go but so so low because your hand kind of gets in the way. It's not like you can have it all the way down. And on some pens, the feed will kind of get in the way too. If you have it too low, the feed will start to drag on the paper. So you'll find if you keep it in that 45 degree range, that's gonna be right about in that sweet spot that you want. All right, and then kind of tailing off that, at Vixtu on Twitter said, exactly what is a music nib? The two questions might not seem completely related, but they are related. And I wanna give a special shout out to my buddy George Ramakis here, who um, I met at the DC show this past year. And as it turns out, his sister, Catherine, is the number one Goulet fan, so she tells me. And she's a loyal watcher of Q&A. So special shout out to you, Catherine. I'm probably making you squeal right now, but <laughs> got to meet both of them at DC. They're really, really super cool. But George is really into vintage stuff. And we, we got to talking about vintage stuff. And of course, the Noodlers and the Ponset with the music nib came up. And he started talking about all this music nib history and stuff. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. Because you know I get asked quite a bit about 
what is a music nib and what is the history and all this kind of stuff. And I think the fact that Neponset has been coming out and um, uh, Platinum has come out with uh, newer versions of their music nib um, on their Century line of pens. They've just come out with it on the um, Bourgogne and the Chartres Blue. So, uh, you know, a, lo a lot of buzz, I think, is going on with the music, music nibs right now. And um, the only personal experience that I have with music nibs at this point is I've got a Sailor 1911L with a music nib, and I've got the Platinum uh, music nib. Um, the 1911L, to me, is really not a true music nib. It's really just kind of more of a stub. Um, so that one is, to me, is kind of pushing it a little bit. It's, it's kind of more marketing hype than anything else. Um, just got to be honest. And that's kind of what George was telling me too. Um, and then the platinum one is a little bit more to what a music nib is. And I'll explain that here in a second. So I was talking to George and we emailed back and forth a little bit about these, these music nibs. So I'm going to go off kind of his expertise a little bit because I have some experience with those two, but I don't have like the deep like vintage knowledge of the music nib. But, you know, um, what George is saying here is that, uh, you know, it started sometime before the 1920s, but the 20s is when like Waterman started to advertise the three time music nib. Um, the true kind of true music nibs will have three tines instead of two. So it's actually got two slits cut in the nib. Um, and there's kind of a dual purpose for that. One of them is that it allows for an increased ink flow. So it's going to write really wet. And the platinum one absolutely does that. Um, and then the other, the other point of it is having three tines is allows them to be a little more flexible and spread out a little bit so you can get some more line variation. It's already kind of a stub-like pen. Um, the nib is ground to be kind of stub-like. But the way that it's ground, a normal stub, they grind. Um, so it's, an, it's OK. If you're not familiar with like a stub versus an italic, essentially when you've got a regular nib, it's going to be a ball, a ball of iridium or some kind of alloy like that that's going to be on the tip. And it's going to write and it's going to be kind of uniform in whatever direction you're writing. If you have something that's ground to be italic or a stub, it's going to be ground more like this. So on the cross stroke, it's going to be a thin line. On the down stroke, it's going to be a broad line. That's kind of how they're ground. Well, usually what happens when they're ground like that with a stub or a cursive italic it's ground so that it's flat, but the corners are really rounded. So when you're writing on the page, it's going to be smooth as opposed to a crisp italic where it's literally just like hard square edges on that nib and it can easily cut the paper and feel really scratchy. Uh, but it takes a lot of practice to write with those. And I don't know a single manufacturer that makes a true crisp italic because they would get so many returns on those because people wouldn't know what's going on. They wouldn't be properly used most of the time. So everybody makes stubs, cursive italics. So they're going to be rounded. But I, from what George is saying here, and it kind of makes sense to me now that I think about it, the music nibs are ground to be rounded not only on the bottom corners, but on the top corners as well. So the whole nib is kind of that stub-like shape, but the corners are all rounded out so that it writes really smoothly kind of in whatever orientation that you're holding it. And we were just talking about holding a pen more upright versus down or whatever. Well, if you use that music pen, you'll notice you can hold it really upright and even go, go overboard a little bit, and it'll still write smoothly. And the reason they do that is because if you think about when you're composing music, often you're going to be doing it on a music stand or something like that, like at a piano. Um, and when you have that, your music is very upright. And you're writing with the pen coming kind of straight at it, kind of the equivalent of holding it vertical or maybe even over vertical uh, if it was to be laying flat. So they grind the nib like that so that it can write smoothly and flow well holding kind of straight at the paper like that. I honestly had never really thought about it like that until George pointed it out. But it totally makes sense to me because I noticed in my own experience of using a music pen, if you're holding it much flatter, it's just kind of writing more like a broad nib. Like it doesn't have as much variation between the cross stroke and the down stroke like you would have with a normal stub. But when you hold it more upright, that's when you see more of the variation. And it makes sense because that's kind of how the things are ground like that. Now, how many people are actually writing music with these pens? Probably not that many, but that's kind of the reason that it's the ground like that. And um, the, the conversation about the um, Noodler's Neponset, that pen is coming out sometime soon. Stephen Brown's got a video on that. There's like one of these pens that's out there floating around in the world. Um, and uh, it's really cool. But that one, that one appears to be more true to the original idea of the music pen, which is to have that, that, that grind, but also to have the flexibility as well. And apparently the flexibility is fairly intense on that pen, much more so than either the Sailor or the Platinum ones that I'm familiar with. 
Now there are a couple other music nibs that are out there. I think Pilot's got one. I've never used it. Um, and so I think they might be bringing that in sometime soon. They're, they are coming out with a custom 912 in the US here later this year. Um, Pilot actually kind of asked us what, what nibs we should bring in. And I, I want to say that they're bringing in a music nib. So that will be really interesting to see what theirs is like. Um, but maybe there's some reviews out there. Maybe we should check that out. But anyway, that's kind of more what the music nib is supposed to be about. So it's a stub that's meant to be held more in a vertical position. All right, Jacob W. on Facebook. I found that American fountain pens are often overlooked when talked about quality pens. Most collectors only talk about European pens such as the Pelican... Excuse me. Oof such as the Pelican Suvron series, or Asian pens such as the Pilot Custom series. I was wondering what American-made pen you thought could compete with these higher-end pens and why these companies often go unnoticed or less discussed. Well, a lot of that has to do with the fact that America is not a really strong fountain pen culture uh, compared to Europe and Japan. Um, and their American manufacturing is not exactly on the rise in most uh, industries as well. So if you're talking about American industry for a product that is not very much used in America, well, that's why you don't see a lot of them. And pretty much the only ones that I can think of are very small independent manufacturers. Um, Edison is one. That's Brian and Andrea Gray. They're in Milan, Ohio. And um, they're just running it out of a small shop. They've got like three people that work there. Um, Bexley, they've got a few people. They're kind of a similar operation to Edison. Um, little, been around a little bit longer, but similar kind of thing. Um, Franklin Kristoff, I don't know much about them, but I think they're a fairly small operation as well. Um, Gate City, I think, is made for Richard Bender. I don't really know who makes those pens, but I believe they're American made. Um, and honestly, that's it. I mean, you've got Noodlers as well, American company through and through. Um, most of their I think most of the components are made in the U.S. I don't know. I think in the U.S. you have to have 60% of the manufacturing going on in the U.S. And I don't know that that's the case with Noodlers because I know the pens are, are made in India. I think a lot of the components come from the U.S., but, you know, it's, it gets kind of cloudy. It's like, and then you've got a company like Monteverde where, you know, the pens are actually made mostly overseas, but then they're assembled, they're designed, the companies run in the U.S. So that's a lot of U.S. companies these days. It's like to get everything done strictly with U.S. stuff is just not really happening anymore because everything, you know, there's global commerce, parts and pieces and stuff are coming from all over the world. Things are partially assembled here and there and it's put together here and packaging comes from there. And, you know, it just, it all kind of comes together like that. Um, so if you're talking about, you know, Pelican versus Pilot and all that, the reason you don't really see like higher end pens that are competing with that is because all of the like old school companies that have been around as long as companies like Pelican and Pilot, um, they're either not around anymore or they've been moved overseas. You know, think about like Waterman is now in, in France, right? Um, Parker, they're not in the US anymore. Schaefer, you know, these are all made overseas now. So they're not, you know, these kind of like companies of old, they are not around in the US anymore. So that's why you don't see a lot of American, American pens that are touted like that. However, I will say that these, these brands are good, but they're just, they're not, they're not as established as these other ones. You know, I think, you know, they've been around like 10, 15 years at the most, you know. All right, Bianca N on Facebook. What is the recommended cleaning for pens that have iron gall ink in them? I've heard vinegar. I have a Lamy that had document ink in it. And even though I flushed the nib, it's now really fussy. The converter has been dyed as well. Any advice would be awesome. Um, it depends on the ink that's being used. Modern iron gall ink is really tame compared to like a true iron gall. You know, true iron gall ink made from like oak galls and all this stuff, um, those are actually pretty, uh, pretty acidic and not particularly great for fountain pens. Um, actually, the true iron galls are too thick to even be used in fountain pens. They need to be used with dip pens. You're talking like the type of stuff that's on like, you know, thousand year old documents and stuff like that. Um, that's all stuff that's too thick to even use in a fountain pen. So modern formulations, if you're talking like, you know, the Roaring Klingner inks and, you know, I think Organic Studio has got a couple and um, there's some document inks um, from Diatromentis, but I don't think those are iron gall. 
Um, I think that Mont Blanc, their blue, blue black or whatever is, is um, iron gall as well. None of those are really true iron gall. Um, they just used some like iron gall type properties in them to give them permanence. The most iron gall one that I know in a fountain pen friendly form is Diamine Registrar's Blue Black. And um, that one, you know, is probably one of the more, I guess, aggressive ones. Um, so I usually don't recommend that unless somebody really knows what they're getting into with Iron Gall. And uh, I can't speak specifically about your Lamy. You know, I would say you definitely would want to clean it. What I did some research and I, I'm not a big, huge, like, Iron Gall fan. There's not that many Iron Gall inks out there. And, and with cellulose reactive inks like the Noodlers and other permanent inks and pigmented ink and stuff like that, the, the need for Iron Gall is not quite there as much anymore. Um, you know, around the early 1900s is when modern formulations started to overtake Iron Gall and Iron Gall just started to not be as critical anymore. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> so I did some research on FPN and found that a lot of people are using Iron Gall. Um, a yeah, vinegar solution is kind of the first go-to for cleaning it out. So going with like one part vinegar to 10 parts water, like the standard white vinegar, um, that's kind of what's recommended. And then beyond that, going to either like a bleach or an ammonia based solution, something of a similar formula to that, um, like a you know, pen flush type, type thing, um, would be um, the next step to do after the vinegar if it still needs to be cleaned out more. All right, Yen T on Facebook. After flushing the pen, is it okay to fill it up with ink immediately, or do I have to wait for the nib and converter to dry up first? And any good recommendation for a ballpoint pen or rollerball pen that can be refilled without, or re, that can be refilled using fountain pen ink? All right, so a two-parter here. First one, flushing the pen, cleaning it out. You can go ahead and ink, ink that sucker right up. What I like to do, um, you definitely don't need to like wait for it to completely dry up. The best thing is after you've uh, flushed it all out, cleaned it, water's clear, everything looks good, take a paper towel and just touch it to the nib in the feed like this. And it is gonna draw out all of the excess water that's in the feed and wick all that out of there. And then that's all you need to do. There might be a tiny little bit of water that's left in here, but ink is mostly water anyway. And the amount of tiny little bit of ink that's left in, or uh, the little bit of water that's left in your pen after cleaning and wicking it like that is gonna be insignificant compared to the volume of ink that you're putting into your pen. So you don't need to worry about, you know, doing it unless you have like, sewage water in your particular area and you're just really paranoid about that, um, then maybe you wanna to try to dry it out a little more. But honestly, if you're just leaving a pen to air dry and you've got like really kind of have hard mineralized water, letting it dry out is really not gonna fix anything anyway because all the minerals and stuff are gonna be left after it's dried anyway. And then as soon as you ink it up, it's gonna reconstitute all those minerals or the minerals will build up over time. So there's really not much of a benefit to letting it dry out completely before you ink it back up. That's just my personal opinion. Um, then the second question that you asked was a good recommendation for a ballpoint or rollerball pen that can be used to refill with fountain pen ink. Yeah, there are a few and we've seen in the last couple of years, some of these uh, refillable rollerball pens come up. There's a Monteverde One Touch Engage. Noodlers has one, um, the rollerball pen. J.R. Bond's got one. Kaweco has some. Um, I honestly have just, I mean, the Monteverde one to me writes better than the re all the rest of them. And Monteverde is another one called the Ink Ball, which is a similar kind of thing. Um, they've, uh, there's also a couple other, Visconti has like the Eco Roller, and I think Delta's got one as well. But the problem is that you're, you're making a compromise between a fountain pen and a roller ball. So the idea behind these refillable roller balls is you get the advantage of choosing whatever ink you want, the vibrant colors and all that good stuff, but yet it's in the convenient package of a refillable roller ball. It sounds great. Um, in practicality, it's not as great as it sounds because you are still getting the drawbacks to both formats as well. The roller ball, the tip, if it dries out and all that, it's not gonna write as well. It's not going to feel as smooth as a fountain pen because it's a roller ball. And it, if it gets like crusted up or if you drop it, it gets damp, you know, whatever, it can squeak, it can write worse and you know, it can have starting issues and st you know, it's just, it's still a roller ball. And then with the fountain pen ink, it's, it's going to be, um, bleed a little bit less than it would in a fountain pen because it's not gushing out quite as much ink. 
but even still, it's still gonna bleed through on more papers than it would with like a gel or a paste ink from a wall point. So it's, you know, it's trade-offs. It's just compromises all around. Some people really like it, but honestly, what we've found here is that most people are just not quite as thrilled with the result they get with the refillable rollerball as they initially would have hoped. And part of that too might just be that a lot of the refillable rollerballs that are out there are either really expensive, you know, $100 or more, or really cheap, like the JR Bonds, like 10 bucks, you know? So it's, it, you either get something that feels kind of cheap or something that is so expensive, you might as well just have bought a really nice fountain pen. So I don't know, to me, there's just a lot of compromises and it's a neat concept and it would be worth trying out maybe if it's of interest to you. But for me, I'm more of a purist. I'd rather just use a real fountain pen. Scott R on Facebook, <clears throat> perhaps worthy of a Q&A comment. In the video of George W. Bush taking the ALS challenge, we can plainly see the former president writing with a Pilot Varsity fountain pen in blue. I never voted for the guy, but I endorse his, cho endorse his choice of writing instruments. All right, so Scott didn't really have a question here. He just wanted to point that out. I noticed that too. I actually, before you posted this comment, I'd seen that, um, that video of George W. Bush doing the ALS thing, and I thought that was kind of cool. He challenged Bill Clinton to it, and as of the point time that I'm shooting this video, it's still within that 24-hour, I guess, open window of when Clinton could uh, come back and do it. So that would be kind of fun to, to do that. But, you know, um, it is kind of neat that he's using a varsity. It's kind of like, wow, really, a varsity? Like, that's like one of the cheapest fountain pens you can get. But hey, you know, whatever works. Uh, I guess maybe you just, you know, maybe he's new to fountain pens. You don't know. Maybe he's just trying new stuff in his, uh, in his later years. I don't know. Um, I did put that pen in my fountain pen for newbies, so not to take any credit for that, but um, I, I, I like the Varsity. It's a solid writing pen. It's, it's a great performing pen. So, yeah, it's kind of neat that it was in that video, but... Um, you know, even the, the whole um, ALS thing, like it was a good challenge, I did it. Um, it does feel a little bandwagon-like at this point. You know, there's a lot of people that are doing it. It's definitely a peer pressure kind of thing. And I personally have never been like really big into peer pressure and whatnot, but you know, it's a little different than like, I was thinking last year, like with the Harlem Shake, like that was a bandwagon, everybody jumped on it and then it fizzled out and everybody got sick of it really quick. I'm sure it's getting to that point with the ALS, but the fact that it's for a cause, is kind of a little cool, you know, and, and the fact that there's something really, really fun to go along with it is neat. So that's why I did it was because it was for a good cause and I thought it'd be fun for you all to see ice water dumped on my head. <laughs> but, uh, next question, Flavio A on Facebook. Does the Rodia dot pad have the same kind of paper as other Rodia pads, like the premium, not considering the color and the dots, of course. I have both mentioned and the dot pad paper seems to be clearly inferior. Whew, clearly inferior? Um, well, okay, so the dot pad paper does have different paper than the premium. So let me say that right there. I don't know about inferior, that's a pretty strong word, but it's slightly less thick, less dense, I guess. Um, it's 80 gram paper in the dot pad versus 90 gram paper of the premium. The premium paper is a little slicker. The premium is essentially an off-white Clairefontaine. Clairefontaine makes both Clairefontaine and Rhodia paper, but the paper is a little bit different in the two notebooks. But if you look at the Rhodia dot pad, sorry, Rhodia web notebook and the Rhodia premium, that paper is gonna be 90 gram slicker. It's gonna be similar to what you see in the Clairefontaine notebooks, as opposed to what's in the dot pad, which is going to be similar to what's in the other Rhodia notebooks, like the top staple bound and side staple bound 80 gram notebooks and those are going to feel just a little bit toothier, not quite as smooth, but it's still really solid paper. Like I would not call that paper inferior by any means at all. It's just not gonna be quite as slick as the stuff that's in the Rhodia Premium. All right, Alan L on Facebook, any word on this year's limited VP? So the vanishing point. Every year Pilot comes out with a limited edition vanishing point. They number it, comes in a fancy box. It's got a different color. It's really cool. It's pretty limited. Um, last year was severely limited because it was their um, uh, special anniversary, but uh, the 50th anniversary. But this year um, is not going to be as elaborate. So last year's pen was like, $550. This year is going to be, you know, lower. So it's going to be more than a normal vanishing point. It's going to be probably just over $200 for that pen. 
Um, and I can say that I do know what the color is going to be, but I cannot tell you what that is. Uh, as far as when it's going to come out, it's probably going to be a little bit later this year. Normally, we would start to hear about it around this time, you know, like July, August. Um, I don't know exactly when Pilot's going to announce it. I am. I have a, a cone of silence upon me. I'm not allowed to talk about it, um, but um, you can pester me all you want, but I'm not going to say. Um, so um, it, is, it is neat. I like it. I like the color, if that matters at all. Um, but uh, it should be, I, I think it's going to be later this year um, than, than what it normally is. So that's about all I can say. All right, next question, actually next two questions are from Facebook. Um, I do not know your name. I apologize. Common causes of inconsistent flow besides stuff between the tines? That's the first question. Um, so inconsistent flow, it could be that the pen might need to be cleaned, you know, not necessarily stuff between the tines, it could be stuff in the feed, either um, paper fibers that's worked its way up in there, um, old dried ink that's maybe crusted up, if you've got really hard mineralized water that you've been cleaning with, maybe stuff's built up in there, that's a little rare. Um, but um, just cleaning it out is always a good first step. Um, it could be more of a mechanical issue with the nib itself. If you've got, you know, two tines like this and they are pushed really close together where there's no, you know, um, capillary action that can come through, that is like one of the biggest issues with constricted flow is that if the, the tines, there should be a little tiny space in between those tines so that the ink has to flow properly through it. If you've got those tines pressed together like that, the ink uh, it, it's not going to flow as well. So that is pretty easy to fix. You can either flip the nib around and gently push up just above the feed here. You can push up with your fingernail and push those tines up like so to spread them out a little bit. And it helps if you have a loop. You can look and see if, you know, hold it up to the light and if you can see light coming through the tines all the way up to the tip, then you know you have a good good flow situation there. Um, another way that you can go about it, this way is a little less precise, but if you are holding the pen in your hand and you are pressing and kind of flexing the nibs out a little bit, like kind of over pressurizing it to allow those times. Now it's really easy to overdo it that way, so you gotta be careful. But that can also flex those times out a little bit and allow them to um, give you that space in between them uh, to help the flow. Um, another thing that can do it is, depending on how the nib is manufactured, it's not usually an issue with some of the higher end pens, but depending on if you got like an off-brand pen or something like that, um, it, you could have some imperfections in the slit. They have these um, like abrasive wheels that they use to actually cut the slit. And interesting little point of fact, you know how a lot of nibs have the hole that's right here in the nib? That hole actually doesn't really serve a functional purpose. That hole is really just there as a guide for when they're cutting the slit through the nib. It's a place for the cutting wheel to stop in a precise place, is right at that hole. A little interesting thing. But anyway, the cutting wheel, as it's cutting through, if the cutting wheel is off a little bit or it's got a little piece of abrasive that's going rogue or if somebody, like, if they're doing it by hand or if the machine does something weird, um, then you could get little nicks, you know, almost microscopic, but little nicks in the slit of that feed that could cause the ink to go rogue. Um, that will increase your chance of nib creep um, and that will also uh, constrict your flow a little bit. That one is perhaps not as common um, and a loop will help you to inspect to see if that is the issue, but that, that can be an issue sometimes. Um, let's see, your improperly aligned tines, that can be it sometimes too. Usually that will accompany a scratchy feeling, so that one, usually the scratchiness will bother you more than the flow issue itself. But if your tines like this, if one of them, you know, here's your tines, if one of them is up and one of them is down, you're not getting a consistent contact with the ink to the paper, and that can cause flow issues. Um, paper fibers in the tines themselves, especially if you have misaligned tines and it's, you got one of the tines is kind of digging in and like scraping the paper as you go, paper can jam up in there and that can either restrict the flow if the paper gets jammed up too much in there and usually you can see if you've got paper in there even without a loop, but sometimes you can't always see it. Um, and then other times you can get paper fibers that jam up in that tip and it can act like a felt tip and give you this really fat swath and that is usually pretty obvious because you're like, why is this thing writing like a paintbrush? Um, so that's, that's something to watch out for. 
And then um, the last thing I had on here was that uh, if the ink has started to dry up in the pen, if you've got your pen that's sitting for a while, you know, the nib itself could all be beautiful. You could have a nice ink in there. But if the pen has started to dry out at all, you know, especially if you're either in a really hot, dry climate or if you're in, you know, like the winter time and you have heat blasting and it's really dry humid humidity in the air, um, then you can have uh, the water from your ink can start evaporating out of your pen and be left with more of a concentrated dye and the dye does not flow as well as the water does through your pen. So that can help to restrict the flow as well. <clears throat> and then your next question you had, is it possible to remove the nib of a preppy from the feed? So I have a platinum preppy right here. Um, you know, most of you are familiar with the platinum preppy. The nib looks fairly similar to a Lamy nib, if you're familiar with that at all. You know, Lamy has a nib on their pen like so, and it's, you know, it's a little bit bigger, but it's fairly consistent. It's still got the wings here that hold the nib onto the feed, and with the Lamy, you know, you can pull the nib off of there and swap it out fairly easily. Um, Platinum's is not quite the same way. Um, you know, these things are mass manufactured, as you can imagine, for a $4 pen. Um, you can pull the nib and feed out together very easily. That's just friction fit inside there. But you know, I was trying and I just could not get this nib to come off of this feed. I think when they pinch this thing on here, I think they actually like, it like clamps onto the feed. I don't think it's like made to be this perfect consistent nib and then slides on to the feed. I think probably when they, this is total speculation on my part, but when they're manufacturing it, they might wrap the nib onto the feed itself when they manufacture it. That's just my guess because this thing is not sliding off easily. So perhaps there's a way to do it, but I messed around with it for a good few minutes and was not able to do it without doing what I thought was going to damage the pen. So if anybody else has figured that out, that'd be kind of neat, but I don't know, really know what it's gonna buy you because there's only two nib sizes that they have for this right now. And you know, it's, it's easy enough to swap it with the feed and they don't sell nibs separately. So, you know, even if you damage it or something, it's a $4 pen. So you just replace the thing for, you know, just the nib, the pen itself is, you know, a third of the price of just a Lamy nib. So you would just replace the whole pen if anything did happen to it. So there you go, that's gonna be it for this week's Q&A. Hope you enjoyed these questions. I am gonna be shooting the next week's Q&A, so I'm not gonna push you quite as hard for questions right now. I'll push you harder in the next video because that's when I will actually be um, out of town and I will need them for the following week. So I hope you enjoyed this one. Next week, I'm just gonna be doing another open forum. I actually got so many questions for this week that I'm just able to double it up and just do two Q and A's uh, for while I'm gone. So that's kind of cool. I'm able to continue to do that even though I'm gonna be out of town. So I hope you enjoyed this. If you've got any questions, you know, feel free to leave in the comments. You know, I won't use it for next week, but I'll be able to, you know, dive in and use it for a future Q&A possibly. Um, you can leave it on Inc. Nouveau or on YouTube. You can ask on Facebook, Twitter, and you can email GouletQA at GouletPens.com. So I hope you enjoyed this one. Um, special shout out to all my folks that I uh, got me the questions this week. I really appreciate all the feedback you guys have been getting. I'm still enjoying doing the Q&A thing, 45 of them. It's just crazy. Um, so anyway, hope you have a wonderful weekend and a great rest of the week. Make sure to subscribe to this on YouTube if you like this video and you want more like it. So thank you so much and right on. Bye.